Hello and welcome to InfoWars Nightly News with me, your host, Paul Joseph Watson, on this March 29th edition of the show. Tonight on the InfoWars Nightly News, the Obama birth certificate scandal accelerates. America's toughest sheriff, Joe Arpaio, and his chief investigator, Mike Zullo, talk to InfoWars about the media blackout surrounding Obama's fraudulent birth certificate and the growing list of missing records. The majority of politicians don't even want to talk about it, yeah. Republicans and Democrats. It's like the plague to talk about this. I've never seen anything like this, and I've been a top federal law enforcement official for years and years. I'm not dropping this. I'm not dropping this. I'm going to keep moving forward. An InfoWars exclusive report with the Cold Case Posse. Plus, why does the Department of Homeland Security need 450 million hollow point bullets? Are they attempting to buy up ammunition so Americans are unable to arm themselves? The American Dream investigates. Then, Urian Mason, writer, contributor, and Rockefeller deep researcher, joins us to talk about Agenda 21 and the Rockefellers' crimes against humanity. All that plus more on the InfoWars Nightly News. And now, we take you to London, England, and Paul Joseph Watson. Going straight to the news now, the shocking face of China's brutal one-child policy. This is the shocking face of China's brutal one-child policy, which many academics and pressure groups are now calling to be imposed in the West. And this image that we've got on the website shows a nine-month-old baby lying dead in a bucket, forcibly aborted by Chinese family planning authorities in the town of Moshan, which is in Shandong province. And because the babies of this unfortunate child had already had a, a, a baby, they were subject to the dictatorial one-child policy. Um, the mother was abducted, injected with poison, and, you know, the, the abortion was induced. And after the baby was, quote, pulled out inhumanely like a piece of meat, which is the direct quote, uh, it was still alive and actually began to cry before being um, carelessly slung into this bucket uh, and left to die. And uh, again, Ted Turner, you know, Joe Biden fully understands China's one-child policy. Uh, White House Zion Tsar John P. Holdren, academics out the University of Melbourne. The establishment is all pushing this meme of the need to introduce a one-child policy for population control. And then the trendies and control freaks come out uh, and get right behind it because uh, something I'd like to share with you actually on our Facebook page when we posted this story. This was one of the uh, comments from one of the trendies who took great pleasure in seeing the image of this forcibly aborted child slung into a bucket. Quote, when people aren't smart enough to control their breeding, governments will take action. No sympathy here. So that was a comment left in response to this shocking image of this aborted child uh, by somebody on our Facebook page. Well, first off, you should count yourself lucky um, that your parents didn't display the same lack of sympathy and abort you. And secondly, and this is the common theme amongst these trendies, this is the meme that they put out, they're advocating that the state have the power to abduct women off the street, inject them with poison and forcibly rip out their babies while they're still alive. That's the new trendy liberalism. Um, and they've got the nerve to post it in a public forum on Facebook like it's just a, a reasonable opinion. Um, but it's, you know, it's the mindset of a sick minority, but it's one shared by the elite. Um, this is about academia and the establishment introducing the myth, the myth of overpopulation, which is what global warming, man-made climate change has been rebranded as deliberately by the UN, um, to introduce the same kind of arcane eugenic system that was practiced by the Nazis, who, of course, got all their ideas from the British. You know, starting with the eugenic society, which created Planned Parenthood, and now the eugenic society is called the Galton Institute. And that is one of the major groups out there pushing this myth of overpopulation to justify neo-eugenics, the apex of which is what happens in China, which is what they're pushing for in the West. And these are the same groups that were the inspiration for Adolf Hitler to kill disabled children in Nazi Germany 
these are the same ones um, pushing for the one child policy today. And this is always where it ends up. It's not just, oh, let's tax them if they have another child. It always ends up in forcible abortion. Uh, but I finished my article on this with a dash of hope because I said, you know, even though this baby's lifespan was minute and virtually non-existent, at least its death was not in vain because as a result of people seeing this image, uh, apart from the trendies on Facebook who find pleasure in it and say they've got no sympathy with a forcibly aborted baby, um, people are going to see it and they're going to choose not to have abortions themselves as a result of these shocking images. So in the long run, uh, this tragic story might actually end up saving more babies' lives. Next story, report, Iran attack postponed until spring 2013. Israel's plan to attack Iran has been po postponed until spring 2013 following a war simulation that showed Iran could kill 200 Americans with a single missile attack, um, according to a report by senior Haaretz correspondent Amir Oren. Uh, and basically, many are of the opinion now that the Israelis, having done this deal with Obama where the U.S. will supply the bunker busters and the refueling planes, has convinced Israel to back off the attack until after the uh, November election. And whether that's, you know, heralds the second term of Obama, or we see Romney or somebody else get in, the policy is going to be exactly the same. So speculation that it's been delayed until next year. Of course, we know Iraq was uh, initially scheduled to take place in 2002. It got delayed until 2003. Um, but on the other hand, you've got two U.S. aircraft carriers already positioned in the Persian Gulf. You've got another one, the USS Enterprise, on its way. And then you've got, as re we reported last week, four anti-mine ships also on their way to the Strait of Hormuz. Um, so although the chatter on Iran has gone relatively quiet for the time being, the fact that that naval might is still in the region um, suggests that the whole situation is very much still a powder keg. Remember, uh, the neocons have been begging Obama to go to war for years. So um, him attacking Iran before the election is not going to do his street cred with them much harm. In fact, they're you know prodding him to do it. Um, and he could pose as this tough guy war leader before the election to obtain votes if he does that. So disagreement on when the attack will take place, but still the consensus is that it will take place within the next year. Why does the Department of Homeland Security need 450 million hollow point bullets? This is a story out of the American Dream. Somebody out there has decided that the Department of Homeland Security needs a whole lot of ammunition. Recently, it was announced that ATK was awarded a contract to provide up to 450 million hollow point bullets to the Department of Homeland Security over the next five years. Um, and this article asks, you know, what are these 450 million rounds for? Doesn't it sound a little bit excessive? Well, there's no doubt, as we documented, that Homeland Security is arming itself to the teeth. Uh, you may recall the report we did um, last month, I believe it was, concerning how the DHS was hiring hundreds of armed security guards to protect federal buildings. Um, we know that DHS was preparing for violence on behalf of the Occupy Wall Street movement, and indeed, they were the ones leading the crackdown, directing the New York police. They actually had their own FPS ar agents arresting photographers on the scene as well. So we've also got, as we reported back in January, DHS guards, uh, again armed with semi-automatics, running this checkpoint at a, at a Florida social security office, you know, checking people's IDs. So it's obvious what they're preparing for. I mean, the DOD characterizes protest as low-level terrorism. So DHS, like most other law enforcement bodies, agencies, is preparing for mass civil unrest. They know that gun sales in America are, are at an all-time high. Um, you know, we had Black Friday purchases, record levels. Again, that's carried into this year. And it's all part of the effort to refocus the apparatus of the war on terror against the American people. That's why Homeland Security is arming itself to the teeth. Seismometer station rules out earthquakes as cause of Clintonville booms. Despite official claims to the contrary, early data from seismometer station in Wisconsin 
rules out earthquakes as an explanation for Tuesday night's mysterious booms in the town of Clintonville as residents continue to clamor for answers amidst increasing suspicion. So basically they had the um, National Earthquake Information Center there in Colorado come out immediately after these booms on Tuesday night and said there was no earthquake activity whatsoever. Geophysicist Joe Bellini also came out and said that, quote, we detected nothing from last night in terms of earthquakes. So these booms, which are described as uh, like underground fireworks, first reported a couple of Sundays ago. Then, of course, we had the USGS come out and say, uh, oh, we missed the earthquake. There was actually an earthquake that occurred on Tuesday, 1.5 on the Richter scale, and that's what's causing the booms. Well, um, residents were quick to point out that the booms were first reported the previous Sunday, so how could an earthquake that supposedly happened on Tuesday be responsible for them? And then again, a couple of nights ago, they had them again, more booms, louder than before, um, closer together, longer lasting, in an area which is unknown virtually for earthquakes. Wisconsin had a major earthquake for them back in 1947, rattled a few buildings, caused no injuries, and the region is not known for its earthquakes. To have two in a week is virtually impossible. Uh, besides the fact that a town 80 miles away also reported hearing these booms, the USGS itself admits that a 1.5 Richter scale earthquake would only be felt by residents within a few blocks of its epicenter. So how on earth are people 80 miles away feeling it? Um, residents are suspicious, doubts are being cast constantly. Now the USGS is calling on residents to report the booms directly to them. City officials who said, case closed, it was an earthquake, even though it had none of the characteristics of an earthquake, they're on the back foot once again. Um, explanations vary. Secret underground military tunneling, um, carbon sequestration, which is the process of injecting CO2 into the ground, all part of the, the climate change fund, the geoengineering uh, capers. That's scientifically proven to cause earthquakes, so that could be an explanation. Um, you've also got disposable, disposal of wastewater when it's not properly done from uh, gas fracking operations. That's been proven to cause man-made man earthquakes. And of course, the uh, the habitual bogeyman of harp is also being uh, touted as a potential explanation for these booms. Um, so we'll continue to track this. Uh, we're considering sending reporters directly to the scene if uh, these booms continue. The last reports of them were on Tuesday night, Wednesday morning. Um, so we'll continue to uh, follow that story. Next news story on InfoWars Nightly News. March 31st, Operation Global Blackout. Hackers intend to shut down the internet by disabling core DNS servers. This article out of uh, SHTF plan. The hacking group known as Anonymous intends to attack the core servers that control the routing of all internet traffic. Uh, and that is, that is, of course, DNS name servers. Uh, once a particular website is requested, a query is sent to a domain name server, which then redirects it to that web address. You probably know how it works. Uh, without these servers, access to website through tr traditional means, typing in a .com, becomes impossible. So according to this statement released by Anonymous, the hacking group, these servers will come under fire on March 31st, which is on Saturday. And then we have a related article out of the Daily Bell, which asks, Assange and Anonymous as elite helpers. Julian Assange wants to run for public office in Australia, his home country, and Anonymous, who of course are big supporters of Assange, want to destroy the internet, temporarily anyway. We are not surprised. Once more, it would seem Anonymous is acting as a friend, as the powers that be. Of a, as a friend of the powers that be. So again, um, we have Anonymous, which as every, everyone knows is completely infiltrated by the feds. Every case where they get busted proves that. Um, a supposedly anarchist group, which with their every action creates further justification for increased state regulation of the internet. Doesn't seem quite how an anarchist group would go about its business. 
And, you know, Anonymous have made it clear that they don't care who they attack. They've threatened to attack the very people watching their videos on YouTube. Um, you know, they're in it for the lulls, as they say. Uh, most people don't know that Infowars was actually attacked by this same group from the uh, the LulzSec and the 4chan groups that originated and eventually became anonymous. They actually attacked Infowars uh, a few years ago. So again, questions are swirling as to um, why this movement, which is so vehemently being infiltrated, is now calling to shut down the entire internet. Uh, which will basically provide the likes of uh, Joe Lieberman and the cybersecurity crowd uh, the perfect pretext to make the argument that the West needs to impose Chinese-style uh, internet policing on the World Wide Web. So again, we'll see what happens on Saturday. Sometimes they make big, big headlines um, anonymous. Sometimes it falls flat on its face. In fact, one of the legitimate targets of their angst was the Bohemian Grove Club, which they supposedly arranged a protest against, and, you know, a handful of people showed up. So it could either fall flat on its face or it could either cause problems. We, well, we will wait and see on Saturday, 31st of March. Uh, next headline on Infowars Nightly News, Bertha controversy, feds refused to release Obama draft card. Um, this is out of Infowars.com, Steve Watson a request for original documents by a group investigating the eligibility of President Obama has been turned down by the Selective Service System in a move that is sure to court more controversy. Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio, leader of the probe into the authenticity of the now notorious Obama birth certificate, announced earlier this month that he had cause to believe that Obama's Selective Service registration form was also a forgery. And of course, we've also got the article up on Infowars.com tonight from Patrick Henningsen, who is who was there on the scene to interview Arpaio and his uh, cold case posse investigators behind the scenes attempt to kill Arizona's Obama elig elig eligibility bill. You can say that properly. Um, so Henningsen is on the scene. He's done the interviews. And basically in this interview, Arpaio slams the media blackout that has taken place around this birth certificate issue and now it appears that there are shenanigans going on uh, with this bill in Arizona that would force all candidates on the presidential ballot to prove uh, that they are indeed uh, eligible to run for president. People are trying to stop that from getting put through because if it does get passed then Obama could be open to perjury charges if he fails to prove his eligibility. So. I mean, this is this issue is only going to get bigger. But as Opio has stated, there's a mainstream media lockdown on it, uh, so it remains to be seen whether this bill will be passed with the shenanigans going on there in Arizona. And coming up on tonight's show, we've got interviews with Mike Zulo, Jerome Corsi, of course, Sheriff Arpaio, and the state senator there in Arizona exploring this uh, bombshell bertha issue with Patrick Henningsen, InfoWars reporter, on the scene. So stay tuned for that. You don't have to be a criminal sexual deviant to work for the TSA, but it helps. That's right, the talent pool from which the Transportation Security Administration draws its employees um, criminals and perverts is in the news once again today. Quote, the TSA is under intense scrutiny this week following a congressional hearing to examine the agency's performance, which is why higher ups will not be pleased to see the headlines thrown up today by a simple online search. And we can barely keep track of the criminality when it comes to the TSA. Um, some of you will have seen the recent South Park episode with the Toilet Security Administration uh, and how they portrayed these morons is not for, far off the mark because, um, you know, what kind of people look to get jobs that allow them to perform activities that would otherwise be illegal unless they were wearing a, uh, a, a blue uniform and a badge? Well, of course, that would be criminals. And these are the people groping your children. So we have in this roll call of TSA criminals just for the past few days, Bryant Germain Livingston arrested for his alleged involvement in a prostitution ring. So he runs a prostitution ring by night. His day job is groping your girlfriend, all for your safety, of course. 34-year-old former TSA screener Andrew Cheever of Boston, this is another one, 
found to have thousands of child pornography images and videos stored on his co home computer. He's just been busted for that. That's what he does at night. In the day, he's groping your kids. And then there's the case of two TSA officers gone wild who got drunk, trashed a South Beach hotel room, then picked up a semi-automatic handgun and fired six rounds out the window. The Miami Herald reports Jeffrey Piccolella, 27, and Nicholas Anthony Puccio, 25, were arrested and charged with criminal mischief and use of a firearm while under the influence. And that's just, that's just from the past few days. Literally every week, there's a deluge of more TSA perverts and criminals. Um, you know, three more outstanding reasons I just listed there for airports to take advantage of these uh, this recently passed law, which allows them to uh, evict TSA screeners and hire their own private security. Finally, the quote of the day. This comes from Michael Crichton. Whenever you hear the consensus of scientists agree on something or other, reach for your wallet because you're being had. Tale of caution there for global warming alarmists and their hordes of believers. We're going to go to break now and we're going to play the InfoWars Reporter Contest ad. So be sure to get more information on that and jump on board. Then we're going to go to an interview with Hori and May San, the InfoWars.com writer about eugenics, Agenda 21, and a number of, the, of other subjects. And at the end of the show, we've got those interviews with Joe Arpaio and the Cold Case Posse regarding the Obama birther issue. So stay tuned. our biggest contest ever and we're looking for people who love freedom and who want to be all in in the resistance to tyrants so you say you want to fight the new world order why if you were on the radio if you were alex jones you'd really kick some globalist ass well here's your chance we're hiring not one but two new reporters whose reports are gonna be on the radio, whose reports are gonna be on the nightly news, who will even anchor the show. If you're ready, here's your chance to step into my shoes, and I hope you surpass what I've done. Two winners, $10,000 in prizes, and a shot to be a reporter inside the InfoWars.com command center. We're looking to hire one male reporter and one female reporter. And when you win, you win $5,000. Your video gets seen by hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people on YouTube. And you get put into the very front of the running to be hired as a reporter slash anchor right here in our operation. Do you have what it takes to be the next Info Warrior? The rules are posted below me here and at InfoWars.com. This is a big deal. You know, the globalists are expanding their global empire, but at the same time, the people are waking up all over the world. We've expanded our operations in the last year. We've added the nightly news five nights a week. We're making more special reports. We're reaching 15 million people every week. In a year, I want that to be 30 million. This is your chance to join the team. I want to see what you can do. But a big hint is this. Can your news piece make the news? Does it get people's attention? Does it educate people? Does it open minds? That's more important than being beautiful or speaking with perfect eloquence as an orator. All of that is important, but we're looking for people that have that magic spark, that fire of liberty in their heart, because I want you to join our team. I want to give you a launch pad so you can really take off and engage the globalist. And if this works, we'll have contests all the time and we'll continue to build this operation. I'm involved in a talent search, looking for people who have the fires of liberty burning in their hearts and their minds. You've got until April 30th to complete your news report and then we'll announce the winners one week later. Are you gonna join the info war? Do you have what it takes? It's up to you. All serious entries will be posted on InfoWars.com. So everybody wins. You're getting the message of liberty out. 
And that's what really matters. But in the final equation, it's not about showing Alex Jones what you got. It's about showing the world and the globalist that no army can stop an idea whose time has come. Join me in the Info War. So you say you want to fight the Info War. You say you want to go head up against the New World Order. You can do a better job than Alex Jones. I know you can. And here's your chance to prove your mettle. Welcome back to InfoWars Nightly News. And on the subject of that InfoWars reporter contest, which you just saw an ad for, there's a new update article regarding that. Um, also, more information about the submissions process. So I really encourage you to get involved with that. And who knows, you could be appearing on this very show in the not-too-distant future. Now, I'm delighted to welcome a regular and much valued contributor to InfoWars.com uh, and an expert really in the field of Agenda 21 and the neo-eugenics population control movement. And that is Yorian Maysan. Yorian, welcome to InfoWars Nightly News. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Now, first off, for people who don't know, just tell the viewers about yourself and how you got into writing about these subjects. Well, I actually uh, started out uh, by writing a book uh, with a friend of mine. It's called The Secret of Zionsburg. And, uh, well, it's actually about uh, the um, uh, royal family of Holland, uh, the Oranges, uh, Queen Beatrix being the uh, uh, current day exponent of the uh, entire uh, facade. And um, uh, while doing research on that subject, uh, I, of course, um, uh, came uh, to know the um, habits of um, uh, uh, eugenics. Uh, by the elite, and that's the sex cobra gotha families, which are spread throughout Europe, uh, also um, the UK, of course, uh, changing their name to Windsor. And um, in Holland, that's also uh, by Prince Bernard, uh, uh, important influence uh, uh, in regards to the uh, eugen whole eugenics agenda that's being pushed by the uh, elite uh, of, the, of the royalty of Europe. So that's how I uh, uh, like rolled in this information um, uh, and, and well, uh, learned much more about it along the way. Now, your latest article, which is on Infowars.com today, which I read earlier, uh, UN-backed scientists call for megacity population lockup. And this is uh, similar to the Plandopolis agenda that we've covered in the past about herding us into these ghetto cities in the name of, you know, pr protecting the earth from humanity itself. And you've got in there one of the quotes from the scientists um, who was behind this project that you'll talk about. Quote, we certainly don't want them strolling about the entire countryside. We want them to save land for nature by living closely together. And again, you know, just total sneering elitist arrogance, class warfare rhetoric, Yurian, tell people about this uh, planet under pressure organization that you write about in this article and what they're calling for. Well, what they're calling for now is, is, is obviously um, a result of a, a very old agenda. And that agenda is, uh, uh, has been formulated uh, 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 by the term Agenda 21, uh, which actually means um, uh, population reduction. I mean, that's the basic the basic thing about it. Um, it's called sustainability. It's called uh, saving the earth, exactly what you said. Uh, under those names, under those guises, uh, uh, a population reduction agenda is being uh, um, executed. And it's being executed uh, quite effectively uh, uh, so far. Um, but mega cities, uh, like herding the people, uh, closing them in and closing them within uh, the confounds of a, uh, a mega city, of course, being um, a, a prison planet in its own right, every city, uh, a grid, you could say, uh, keeping those people in. Um, and uh, the elite uh, can then uh, roam free around uh, the countryside, which uh, they don't want us strolling through. 
Um, and uh, the basic agenda is, uh, is eugenics. Uh, it has been for a long time. Aaron Dykes did a lot of important research on that subject. And um, uh, everybody should check his work out also. He made a couple of very important YouTube films about that. And in this article, these scientists behind this group talk about humanity creating this anthropocene environment through man-made climate change. You know, even as all their global warming models are proven completely fraudulent about, you know, CO2. Of course, we know, as you said, the Earth is much cooler now than it has been eons in the past before carbon dioxide emissions from human activity. Um, and they accused us of interspecies genocide when they're the ones advocating genocide themselves. I mean, just go through the quotes that you've got in that article. I think there's one towards the end of the article where they talk about directly reducing human population. Right. I think that was the article about the uh, Colorado professor uh, actually uh, 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 quoting the whole uh, anthropogene um, uh, concept, uh, throwing it out there um, and um, uh, adding to that that uh, people um, have um, uh, uh, little time left uh, to uh, cool the planet and otherwise we should just get rid of those uh, people. That's what the elite uh, states. And what this professor, professor actually states is we have to reduce current human, human numbers. So that he, do, he doesn't just say we have to reduce numbers uh, per se, uh, perhaps over the long run, like a mild eugenicist might, might suggest. He says just reduce them right now. So that means killing people, killing people outright. And uh, that's that's just one of the quotes he uh, uh, he made. Um, he he wrote down um, in that uh, particular um, um, uh, essay he wrote. Uh, it's called Environment and Ethics or something. Ethics is a term that keeps popping up. Um, and uh, these are very dangerous people. These are people that have to be stopped in their tracks because otherwise we have a very big problem on our hands. And that was. Uh the article was called Professor Prevent Interspecies Genocide, Reduce Current Human Numbers, and that's Philip Cafaro. And in that, which I read earlier, of course, he advocates China's one-child policy directly. He states, quote, China's policies have largely stabilized its population. Well, yes, they have if you consider wild imbalances in males to females to be a stable situation. And, you know, 500 female suicides a day in China many of which are directly attributable to um, the one-child policy. So, I mean, Yurian, this one-child policy in China was brought about as a result of the error-prone policies of Chairman Mao. You know, he, he wanted the population to have, he wanted warrior mothers to have 10 kids so they could go join the communist army. That's what caused China's um, booming population problem. Now they've got something even worse, which is forced sterilization, forced abortion. Um, why do the elite see China as a model for the West? Because it's a, a, a collectivistic uh, society. So I, I think um, uh, the elite uh, considers uh, the West as it is now and as it has been um, uh, much too individualistic. Uh, so they want a more collectivistic. They want a state that actually uh, uh, micromanages the lives of, of, of all the people that uh, that are there. So the collectivistic model, I think, uh, uh, is um, especially suitable for the plans for, uh, of the elite because of, um, uh, I mean, the, the Chinese have been um, uh, used to uh, like propaganda since, since, since the communists came into power, since Mao came into power. Uh, same goes for uh, for Soviet Union, of course, and that's now um, uh, uh, changed a little bit. But uh, I think that's that's the prime uh, driver because they want to use China as the the new engine for the world, the new economic uh, front runner, and uh, we all have to follow in its wake. Now I want to get on to Rockefeller because a big article that you wrote that got a lot of attention earlier this month was. Um, the the Rockefeller, Rockefeller Foundation actively engaged in mass mind control. Tell us about these documents and how um, they illustrate Rockefeller's involvement in mass brainwashing. Yeah, they have. They've been uh, the Rockefeller Foundation uh, funded it. Uh, 
as far back even as the 20s, I don't even go into that uh, in that particular article, but uh, from the 20s on, they uh, funded uh, psychological um, um, uh, research uh, into um, behavior modification. That's how, how they call it. Uh, so that's uh, uh, social and psychological engineering um, and, and, and how the science of that uh, should be developed. And it should not be developed for the science itself, but it should be developed, of course, for, uh, for their purposes, because uh, they've used the uh, uh, results of that research. Uh, and we don't talk about years, we, talk, we don't talk about decades, we're talking about centuries here, uh, that they've refined this technique and, uh, uh, well, uh, put it out to the people. Uh, predictive programming is a, a, a very important part of that, which Alan Watt covers in, 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 in quite some detail. Uh, predictive programming has been um, uh, found to be uh, so effective that it has been uh, uh, research into that has, uh, has continued, especially by uh, that professor called Hovland, which I write about in that article, uh, which even um, who even um, uh, uh, did more research on that uh, particular subject, predictive programming, and um, uh, went ahead with that. And in these documents, I was also reading, they actually brag about how they basically recruit media figures and journalists to push their agenda. Um, tell us about that. Yeah, I, I, uh, that's it. Uh, media figures, uh, important ones, uh, they have to be recruited uh, to uh, bind uh, a large part of the of the mindless uh, uh, readers, mindless uh, uh, watchers of, of television programs uh, to their causes. I mean, Angelina, Angelina Jolie is, is a good example of uh, uh, how the UN recruits one, uh, and she probably uh, uh, knows all about it. Um, uh, she, she's intelligent enough, I think, uh, to actually know the agenda behind it. But uh, uh, celebrities are being used. UNESCO uh, said in the 50s, uh, we have to use more celebrities, more uh, people to um, um, uh, reform the education, uh, educational process, because that's how, where young people turn to for their, uh, for their amusement and, and their information, finally. Now, one, one question that springs to mind just off the cuff is, how do you find all these documents? I mean, are you going just finding them on the internet or their leaks or do you have to go to libraries? Where do you get the material um, for all these Rocker Founda Rockefeller Foundation articles? Well, the, the Rockefeller Foundation articles are just posted on their website. I mean, it's their yearly reports most most of the time. And if you, um, well, you just have to uh, learn how to use a, a, a search engine on the internet and you'll find the most amazing uh, information uh, spread all throughout the um, uh, internet. You have to use keywords which the elite tends to use, uh, and usually that's euphemisms for uh, their actual purpose. So you have to uh, uh, Google the euphemisms, um, and uh, by doing that, you can find a lot of information. Of course, the library is is very valuable also. So I do uh, a lot of research uh, in the library. I have to order books and all that uh, just to uh, to get some information. So basically, again, it's about them hiding it in plain sight and throwing it in our face. They advertise it all on their own websites, but they know that 99.9% .9 of people just aren't going to go and look, which right. brings me to another question, which is how do we present the threat that this neo-eugenics agenda represents in you know, the modern climate, how do we reach across to people and emphasize the point that it's a, an imminent threat and just not the rantings of eugenesis from 50 years ago as debunkers try to characterize it? I think uh, uh, current events as they unfold uh, are the uh, perfect uh, way to illustrate uh, what these plans are. So I think you have to f uh, um, uh, constantly contrast current information, current events with uh, the knowledge that has been around for like decades or, or even more. So you can, and you can easily couple that uh, to those current events because actually those current events are results of the plannings which have been done decades ago uh, by the social engineers. So I think that contrast uh, uh, in, uh, in articles, I think everybody should uh, just do their own research and, and, and don't be uh, too uh, 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 perfect about it. Just Right, right, and do the research uh, because uh, we need so much more people getting involved in this um, if, if people care about it. And of course, a major fact is that John P. Holder and the White House science czar, who is now in control of, of that 
policy directive, specifically in relation to geoengineering, is now in a position of power, having written in his own textbook um, in 1977 about how we need forced sterilizations, mandatory abortions, you know, Im imposed by a planetary regime. So I suppose the fact that the guy who advocated that is now in the White House is all you need to present people with the fact that this is a very real and imminent threat. That's right. That's right. I, I, I absolutely agree with you. And it's also, of course, uh, a, a fact that uh, uh, it's no coincidence that especially this president uh, chooses uh, 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 John P. Holdren for to be his uh, chief uh, chi uh, science advisor. So it's, it's, it's part of the agenda and Obama's part of it. And of course, Holdren is a, a, an old proponent uh, uh, of the entire idea. Well, it's been fascinating, Jurian. Um, your articles are always keenly read, and we'll look forward to the next one on Infowars.com. Um, Jurian Mesa, have you got your own website just lastly that you want to plug? I don't have a website uh, yet, uh, but I'll make a weblog uh, pretty soon, and uh, I think that's, uh, that's good to do uh, right now. Well, we really appreciate your time and look forward to having you back on InfoWars Nightly News. Yuri and Mason, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. That's going to wrap it up for this Thursday, March 29th edition of InfoWars Nightly News. We'll see you on the next edition. Good night. InfoWars has come down here to Phoenix, Arizona to speak to Sheriff Joe Arpaio and his team, the Cold Case Posse, who are investigating the eligibility of this president, Barack Obama, and his ability to appear on the state ballot. The question of this president's eligibility has been an issue ever since Barack Obama ran for the Democratic Party nomination back in 2008. What's all the fuss about? All the fuss is over a piece of paper, or a PDF to be exact, which was put on the White House website back in April 2011. Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio has put together a cold case posse team of investigators, all volunteers and at no cost to the state, all with law enforcement backgrounds. And what they've found during the course of their investigation is shocking. This document contains, according to the team, a number of an digital anomalies that can only point at a forgery. Sheriff Doc. So very briefly, I want to thank you and the, the legislators for being here. Uh, some uh, is very controversial, uh, but something has to be done. Uh, just briefly, we had a press conference March 1, uh, where we revealed our evidence, and we feel very strongly there was forgery on the birth certificate and the selected service form. I did write to the selected service director, haven't received an answer, but we will continue to ask other law enforcement agencies uh, to assist us in this investigation. Uh, but during the process, uh, we did learn sometimes it's very difficult uh, to get your message out, especially with the blackout, uh, the scenes with the major uh, media across our country. I spent 50 years as a top federal law enforcement officer and the uh, sheriff, and I don't recall ever seeing a, a censorship or somewhat uh, to conceal uh, our investigation and not report. That's another issue. But this is very important. I said after all of this, and I did start off, I talked talk to my uh, uh, chief 
investigator uh, with the posse so there'd be no tax uh, payer uh, money expended. I did say I want to get into this. I want to clear the president. Uh, but unfortunately, during the course of the six-month investigation, that did not happen. We came up with more information. I think uh, you do know what much of the information is about. Initially, we're not going to get into everything else, but I think this bill is very important to at least, and because of what we've gone through, we think it's more important to at least have some law that you have to uh, show that you were born in the United States. So I fully support this bill. I commend the legislators that have the uh, fortitude to go out public on a very controversial subject. I'm not accusing the President of the United States of any crime. However, we do have two suspected crimes, forgery, fraud. And as a law enforcement official, I feel we have to develop that information the best way we can. Thank you. What's the significance of this bill today, this legislation that's been introduced this week? Well, I think it's uh, important. It's only common sense uh, using a, a law to uh, uh, pursue, uh, to make sure the person uh, that is running is who that person is. I don't think it's asking too much. Uh, I believe that our investigation probably uh, substantiates the need for this. When you look at the evidence that we have uh, accrued in the last six months with our cold case policy, anybody with common sense looking at those two documents that we feel are forged would say, wait a minute, you know, we better get another system going and make sure this doesn't happen again. So it's only common sense, but there's a lot of politics involved. People don't want to even talk about it. You can see there's not many people that showed up here. Everybody wants to ignore this subject. Uh, and uh, most of the questions in that press conference on March 1 wasn't about the evidence. They didn't want to talk about that. It's all this has been already done. And, oh, this is old stuff. Why don't they talk about the evidence? Nobody's talking about the evidence, which is very interesting. And there seems to be a, a national blackout on this. I mean, you know, whatever I do, I make national news. When I put people in pink underwear, or, I always make national news. But this one, they don't want to talk to the sheriff. How's the response been from your constituents in general about those who know about this effort? Well, quite frankly, I didn't know how it would work, uh, whether uh, they would be against me, since everybody else seems to avoid the issue. Uh, but it hasn't been as bad as I thought. Uh, I, I don't get many negatives other than these Mickey Mouse threats and garbage through blogs. But the people that I meet, and I meet every day, I'm giving speeches. Hundreds of people a day come up for my picture and so on. But they never uh, say anything bad about what I'm doing on the Obama thing. In fact, a lot of them like what I'm doing. So politically, it hasn't hurt me, but it doesn't matter because I would have done it anyway. But I'm a little surprised at, at the support on this issue, those that are willing to talk about it. Now, all the, the majority of politicians don't even want to talk about it, yeah. Republicans and Democrats. It's like the plague to talk about this. I've never seen anything like this, and I've been a top federal law enforcement official for years and years. And I knew about the Watergate, and I've been through it all. Uh, but I never seen this this situation. Joe Arpaio is the sheriff of Maricopa County. He represents 4.5 million residents here in Phoenix. 250 concerned residents came forward to Joe Arpaio six months ago with concerns about the president's birth certificate and his eligibility to be and run for the highest office in the land. And the Tea Party came to me and asked me to look into it, and I gave it to my volunteer posse made up of ex-cops uh, and attorneys at no cost to the, uh, the taxpayers. And they report to me. I have 3,000 posses and happen to have a cold case posse. And I told them to look into it. I mean, what's the big deal? And uh, when they did, they did a good job in coming up with a lot of evidence. 
Uh, so what should I do? Dump it in the wastebasket and forget it? It's incumbent on me when I find suspicious activity. If I can't handle it, give it to other authorities that can, if they will, and not drop it. So I'm not dropping this. I'm going to keep moving forward. How good is this team you've assembled, uh, in your opinion? Well, they're ex-cops. So, uh, Mike has done a great job uh, on this, living this for 24 hours a day. And uh, does just as good if he was full-time. But he's an ex-cop. He just doesn't get paid. But he has the authority under me, under the Constitution. I can swear in private citizens called the posse, and they have the same coverage as a regular deputy. They just don't get paid. So isn't this great? So I can't get all the public to say you're wasting taxpayers' money. I decided to do this right off the bat because the media would be after me. Why are you wasting taxpayers' money? Although right now, at this point of time, I could use regular deputies. We're talking about two possible fraud and, uh, and forgery cases. This team of investigators has been working on this case since then. And what they have found is extremely revealing and it is unprecedented. What I can tell you from our part in, in this monumental problem is the beginning of this investigation as called for by Sheriff Arpaio, we were instructed. Can't hear you. We were instructed. Any better? No. No. Technical thing. I have no idea how this stuff works. I'll talk about it. Help it out. We were instructed by Sheriff Arpaio to look at this in an unbiased, professional manner. There were no politics involved in this. The onset of this investigation, I told my team that we are here attempting to validate this document. Our attempts to validate the birth certificate document failed relatively early in this uh, venture. Going forward into this document, we began to uncover more and more anomalies that could not be replicated by any test or any standard that we put forth. What that had indicated to us is this document was manufactured, constructed, and presented for a purpose. And that purpose was to deceive. That purpose meant that we had a fraudulent document. The thing that was most shocking to us was the fact that the very items to give authenticity to this document and assurance to the public that this document was creditable was the state registrar stamp and the date stamp authorizing the registration of the document and verifying that the document is indeed factual. Those two stamps can be moved off that document, placed anywhere on the document, and they leave behind them a white ghost. There's only one way that could happen. That meant that the green safety paper background that was on that document was also placed on the document. And we discovered it was placed on the document last. That is a monumental problem. Going forward, we had to look at other information now that was surfacing regarding the identity of the candidate to be president. We were turned and pointed in the direction of a selective service card. Upon inspection of that selective service card, we discovered an anomaly that was glaring, and that had to do with the certification stamp from the post office, the date stamp, indicating that an individual presented himself for a selective service, service as called for by law, I believe it was instituted by President Carter. I had to do it myself. You go to a post office, you present yourself, you give your identification. They take a card that you fill out, that you sign, you attest to that it is you, and they stamp it received. That date stamp, by our indication, by all indications, and by our test, validate our, con our, um, our conclusion that this document is also manipulated and most likely a forgery. That issue alone has severe ramifications, even more so than the birth certificate. There are criminal ramifications to that card. They're standing up for your country, attesting who you are. There is also statute that says that you can be held liable for not filing. You can be found guilty with a five-year prison term 
and a $250,000 fine. We do not believe that card was issued in 1980, and we demonstrated that in our video. The video that we showed the press conference at the time shows that the date stamp, a, a year stamp, 1980, by mandate, by the post office, by mandate, by the government, has to be a four-digit date stamp, 1980. On Mr. Obama's, it is just an 80. The 19 is missing. In addition to that, the 80 is offset far to the right and low to the right, unlike 17 other Selective Service cards that we received through a FOIA request from the Office of Selective Service, two of which came from the same post office within days of each other. This is a problem in identifying the individual or identifying actions of the individual whose name appears on the document. From our perspective, we felt compelled to check with the Secretary of State what happens in situations like this. We came to learn that there are no statutory protections to protect the voting public from anybody who wants to appear on a ballot. As a matter of fact, it's not only unique to Arizona, it's through every state in the nation. Simply fill out a form, sign what you want to sign, give them the money, and they could be on the ballot to be president of the United States. There are no voter protections. From our perspective, this legislation that's being proposed to you today really is nonpartisan. All it has to do is protect parties on both sides. If you want to run from office, for office, more power to you. Just be who you say you are. Let us verify who you say you are. And if there's a problem, there is recourse. You simply cannot fill out a document, attest to be someone, and then if you get found out, you walk scot-free. This legislation harms no one and stops an illegitimate candidate from running for office. And from our position, we believe it's sound, we believe it's fair, and we believe it's nonpartisan. So we obviously are in support of this. After what we've seen today, this investigation goes further. Sheriff Opayo is commissioned us, has commissioned us to go further into this investigation. There are numerous other avenues that we are pursuing, and we are going to continue this. So I would ask everyone to give this fair and sound consideration, read it from a party neutral perspective, and understand it's protecting the voting public, which I am and you are. Thank you. If, if, the, if the legislation gets uh, killed for whatever reason this week, you, are you still going to continue with your efforts? And, and what do you see? Where, where is it going next? Next step, for instance, on a, a federal level or so forth? Oh, we're not stopping. Whether it's passed or not passed, we're going to continue doing our job. This would just help us a little. Actually, this was passed last year. The governor vetoed this. Okay. So I don't understand, and they, they made it a little milder at this time around, so I don't understand why it can't be passed again. But nobody wants to talk about it, probably because I stuck my nose in it, and I'm kind of coming up with evidence that there's something wrong. You'd think that would make everybody want to do something about it. But everybody wants to keep it, don't talk about it. Democrats, Republicans. You name it. So what is this, a political year that everybody's afraid to talk about it? Or they don't want nothing done about it? They don't want to face this issue? That's sad. Do you think America asks a lot of the countries around the world to uphold a certain standard of democracy and transparency in their affairs? How important is it for us to have that level of transparency and accountability and integrity here at home? Is that, is that what this represents? I think it's very important. Now, I'm just looking at it as a law enforcement guy. I'm looking at two crimes, and I'm not accusing the president of uh, violating any law. What we're looking at is two possible forged government documents. If it was you or anybody else, everybody would be saying, how come you're not arresting this guy? How come you're not doing it? Just because it's the president? It, it, it's Nobody wants to touch it? That's sad. So, as I say, we're not accusing the president, but we sure know somebody's responsible for that selected service form and for the birth certificate that they went public and showed. What confuses me is the amateur.
type of uh, operations they were performing. When you look at the birth certificate, that's sort of amateur. And yet everybody says that uh, that's a legitimate birth certificate. Well, I'll tell you how to solve this. And day one, when I launch this uh, operation, all I said, show me the microfish. Mm -hmm. Show the microfish, and it's all over. Yeah. Where's the microfish in the hospital? Come on. We got two twins born at the same time. So just show us the microfish. Another thing that's suspicious is I have, sometimes I have a conspiracy theory, is the fact we went to the archives in Washington and looked at all the immigration forms uh, up to uh, August 1, mm -hmm. 1961, and then August 7th, but there's a whole week missing when he was born. Now, is that another coincidence? I can go on and on and on, and yet nobody wants to talk about it. The press reaction to the Ohio cold case posse investigation has been overwhelmingly negative and skeptical. But this doesn't surprise anybody who follows both the mainstream media and the alternative media on any major issue. That's why InfoWars has come down to Phoenix to take a look closer at this investigation and also to speak to the Posse's lead investigator, Mr. Mike Zullo. My name is Michael Zullo. I am the lead investigator for Sheriff Arpaio's Cold Case Posse. Um, I am a former police detective, former private detective, state of Arizona. Uh, res uh, moved uh, to Arizona in 1993, joined the uh, Sheriff's Posse in 2005, and in 2006 the Sheriff asked me to head up a newly formed Cold Case Posse, uh, specifically used for his purpose, and that answered directly to him. When Sheriff Apio contacted me, he asked me to come down to his office. Um, he relayed to me that he was petitioned by about 250 citizens asking for help. They believed that their voting rights were going to be infringed, and they suspected that the birth certificate uh, put forth by Barack Obama was, in fact, fraudulent, and they asked him to investigate it. When the sheriff uh, contacted me and I did come down, he explained that to me. He also explained to me that he wasn't really sure if this was in his venue or jurisdiction to look at. So rather than assign a compensated detective or a group of detectives to go on a fishing expedition, he assigned it to us. We are volunteers. We have a law enforcement or investigative background, plus legal background. We have a, a number of attorneys that work with us, and we decided to take on the matter. Um, the sheriff made it very clear to me that he wanted an unbiased, non-political investigation, and actually stated to me uh, numerous times that he wanted to clear the president, wanted this issue gone away, and have the country move on. He didn't believe it was good for the country. That's what the mandate. That's how we went. We moved forward. When we started to delve into this, we started to look at the April 27th document, 2011, released by the White House, the long term birth certificate. Um, in looking at the document right off the cuff, it was an electronic file. We started to play around with it basically ourselves to get familiar with it. And as fate would have it, I actually came across an Alex Jones video demonstrating the way the, the document would be taken apart in layers. Rob, let's go ahead and get to this document. Right. Okay, first thing what we're going to do, here's the article on InfoWars. Obama birth certificate raises as many questions as it answers by po Paul Joseph Watson. He's got the birth certificate. You scroll down to the bottom of the article, the whitehouse.gov, Obama's long-form birth certificate, whitehouse.gov. So we're going to click on that. Here's what everybody's been looking at today. Here's the document. We're going to save this into a folder called Obama Birth right here. Nothing in here, and here it says birth certificate long form. So now, if you have a copy of Adobe Illustrator, you open that up. So now we're in Illustrator. You can see up at the top here. We're going to open this really quickly. Here we are in Illustrator, and you can see already that there's little layers, but you can't, it, it moves everything at one layer, okay? So there, I'm going to go back, put it back here. Now watch this. I'm going to click onto it, right click to release clipping mask. This is what everybody's been doing. So now everything has been uh, broke, all the layers have been broken apart. So we'll just grab this layer real quick and we're going to cut and it. And this is like in a Photoshop Look file. You can <laughs> see what was moved before yeah. and what they altered. And you can see that these things were cut in here. I'm sorry, go ahead. So here we are. I'm going to cut this layer. Boom. And now we're going to add it to a different layer on top of that other layer. And now you can see this is a completely different layer, and there is even a missing number on this when you bring this back in. We went to some graphic design experts, um, some forensic document examiners, and we asked their opinion of the document. 
it became apparent to us and apparent to them that the document was layered, but was layered in such a manner that it could only be put together by human logic, not something that could happen by itself in a software type of setting. In other words, a one-button push isn't going to accomplish what happened to that document. So then during our own testing, we took a scan of the president's long-form birth certificate. As a matter of fact, we printed off a copy by turning off the green safety background, which just simply produced a black and white image on a white piece of paper. Perfect. Perfect. We took that image and we photocopied that onto safety paper. We literally made a hard copy document. We took that document, scanned it into a computer, and we got, lo and behold, a one-dimensional document. You could not move anything on it. There were no layers. There was one link, one layer. Nothing moved, nothing could be altered, nothing could be changed. Then we took that same document and we ran it through OCR testing and compression testing and we got links and we got layers. But we didn't get nine links and we didn't get nine layers. We got anywhere from 45 to 250 layers. We ran it through different type of scanning equipment, different copiers, got the same results. The other thing that became extremely apparent to us was that the register stamp and the date stamp could be moved completely off the document and they would leave a white halo background. That struck me because in the document that we printed out, you had a marriage between the black font ink and the green safety paper. There was no separating this. This, though, left a white halo, almost like a ghosting of the, of the information on the stamp. Further analysis showed us that the register stamp and the date stamp were in fact imported to the document from an unknown source document. They were actually 90 degree rotated. They were brought over to the document. They were placed on the document. When we first looked at it, we thought, okay, they took this and they placed it onto the safety paper. But you saw the, ro the, rotation. the rotation. And it's on different layers. Each one of these things have their own separate layer. It's through the history of palette of the uh, software document. Yes its own separate layer. There are separate little entities residing on the document. We first thought, okay, they just took it and they laid it on the document. Although we weren't able to produce the halo effect or the white ghosting effect. Further investigation revealed to us that what they actually did is they worked with almost like a white palette or a white sheet of paper, if you will, did all the printing work, put the stamp on it, put the register stamp, the date stamps, and some other date stamps on it, and then what they did is, by computer generation, replicated green safety paper and applied it last to the document, filling in all the white background. When you take it to that step, what happens is the green safety paper replicated background by computer generation cannot fill in black font. It fills in blank white spaces, doesn't touch any other character. Hence, when you move the document, you get the outline of what was already there. That to us was enough to say the document is 100% manufactured, has been manipulated, but worse than that, the register stamp and the date stamp have no legal authority certifying this document to be anything. It is our position the document has no legal authority and therefore is not a representation of an accurate certificate of live birth from Hawaii or any other state. T tell me about the, a little bit about the registrar part of the stamp. It says abstract on it. It does, and, and that's kind of shocking to us, too, because an abstract, it's a copy of or a variation of. Um, the fact, though, that what they claim is that this is an exact facsimile, a, repro a, a reproduction by photocopying of his birth certificate, the word abstract no longer applies. It either, either is a copy or it's not. Very simple. So abstract doesn't apply in this. They are certifying that this is a true copy of his long-form birth certificate, and they authorized it for release, and they validated it by the register stamp. We contend that didn't happen. We contend that this document was never even a paper document, that this document was birthed inside a computer, built inside a computer, and resided inside a computer until the day they uploaded it to the White House server. This person, is this a person of interest, possibly this uh, registrar, Mr. PhD, Mr. Alvin? Uh, Onaka? Yeah. Um, he's not a person of interest, but to date he has never come forth and said that he personally certified the document. He made, uh, tell us a little bit about segues that your team has made to 
you know, follow up on, on different leads outside of, you know, Arizona, for instance? What transpired is, and we were accused of, especially I believe it was by the Attorney General of Hawaii that said that we never reached out to talk to him, and that is 100% true. The reason being, in the beginning, before we decided uh, to alert the sheriff that we believed we had a forgery, this was nothing more than inquisition. We were inquiring what happened here. Now that we had what we had and we presented it to the sheriff, it's now turned into a full-fledged law enforcement investigation. Now the steps to contact various agencies and request for help happens from this point under that authority. To do it before that would have had zero consequence. We would have gotten nothing out of it. Okay, um, now tell us, you know, you, we, we, we're going into, it's a new area for a lot of people and it's, and it's really digital forensics. Yes. Okay, this is, this is a new, this is a traditional law enforcement, you're dealing with physical, you know, things that you can touch, feel, you can test with chemicals. Uh, Tell us a little bit about your approach and, and how you feel about this new area, which is digital forensics, which you're engaged in. What I've learned is people younger than me are a lot better at this than I am. They understand this to a T. This is extremely complicated information. To put one of these together, you can't just be a, a quote, novice. Even though I believe this was poorly done, you cannot be a novice. You have to have an in-depth understanding of the technical aspects of the software and what happens here. People that uh, work with this stuff for a living, graphic experts, what I learned, I didn't know this when it happened, when this document was produced, within 30 minutes, graphic designers were all questioning its authenticity. It's because they worked with the software. Digital forensics is a science unto itself, but we also live in a very scary time. You cannot rely on your eyes anymore to believe what you see. That's a good point. Okay, I'm just going to move it, move down a little bit. Um, now, is there a hard copy of Obama's birth certificate available for you to look at? Are you guys in the process of, you know, sequestering it? Or to my understanding, if there is a hard copy document. No one other than select individuals from the state of Hawaii profess to have seen it. Um, the state of Hawaii has some very stringent laws when it, regarding vital statistics. And the only way that we would have an ability to see it would be to go to that state and request through court order the ability to see it. And even if we were granted permission to see it by a court, even by directive, the Department of Health in Hawaii could maintain the position of retaining the privilege not to produce it. And that's happened in some other court cases and unrelated incidents of other birth certificates where they just refuse to produce the document. As far as our position, a hard copy paper document is not something we want to see. I can make this into a hard copy. What the public has to understand is this becomes a hard copy at the press of a print button. The short form birth certificate released. 2008 was uploaded to Obama's website. Are you familiar with that and what are your thoughts? I'm familiar with it. We did not do any extensive research on it. I do understand though at some point in time other birth certificates were forged and actually uploaded. There's some speculation out there that a forged document by someone confessing to forge the document actually provided it to the White House. I, we haven't followed that up. Our, our purview right now is just to look at this long form birth certificate because it is what the White House has put up on their website and the President himself pointing to it saying, this is proof positive of my birth. And you as a law enforcement uh, deputized or professional, whatever, in your position as a law enforcement uh, agent, worker, working for the people, at what point, where, where, do you, where would you stand now if, if you, uh, you, you, you seems to be a forged document? Right? Yes. So the, ne the next step is uh, where, where would you go from there? What, in theory, where, where, where could you go? As a look, as a, if this was a crime. If this was a crime anywhere, that's in my jurisdiction. I, I didn't do my selective sure. service. That's, if this were in my jurisdiction, obviously you want to find the individuals responsible for it. You would start the very last person that handled the document. It would be the person that uploaded it to the server that the White House released to the world. That would be the place you start and you just simply work backwards from there. And how did you get it? How did you get it? How did you get it? And eventually you would find the person. 
that's provided there's cooperation. Um, what would normally happen in a situation like that is people will either speak or they will tell you they want an attorney and they'll end it right there. And then you have to find other means, other ways to do it. Um, in a utopian world in law enforcement, that's how I would like to do it. I'd like to interview everybody that ever came in contact with this document. Or, and I'm not going to want to call it a document anymore. This file. It's, a, it's an electronic file. It is not a paper document. It's important to make that distinction. Very big distinction. This was put together so the public themselves, this was put together so someone would look at this on a computer screen and go, oh, that is what it's supposed to look like. It must be real. That's the deception in this. This isn't real. This will never be real. This is a fabrication. This is false. And that's the fraud that's not only committed here in Maricopa County, but it's the fraud that's been committed across the nation. So very important here, actually, uh, you know, the language that's used, uh, especially when we're talking about digital documents versus physical documents. You as an investigator, is very, how, how important is that you pin the right? The, there's other bits of language that have come into yes. this case as well. Just well, pinning the language is really important because if this were to be a physical document, if it started its life as a physical document, in other words, in the Department of Hawaii, they have this exact document in paper form, then obtaining that document would be very, very important to an investigation. Because once we got that document, then we can send that document to forensic document examiners to look at signatures, look at ink, look at some things on the document. The fact that it's digital means we are working with a file. There is no piece of paper for us to touch. And it becomes very difficult in an investigation when you don't have the original, quote, document because it hampers the investigation and it hampers forensic experts from rendering opinions. Did you come across any other anomalies with uh, what you see there on that file uh, in, with regards to against any other sample groups of uh, any other birth certificates around the same time, for instance, from Hawaii did, uh, through your investigation? Is there any other evidence you want to comment on? Here's where this, it, it gets a little complicated from that. And to answer your question, yes, there are some, but there are things that I can't disclose because it's an ongoing investigation. However, there is not another electronic file released of anyone else's birth certificate. I've had birth certificates sent to me from Hawaii. They are on paper. But I've had birth certificates sent to me from Hawaii that are not on green safety paper. They are just on white paper, a computer printout. And it's important for the public to understand that when Governor Amber Crombie went out and said that he was going to prove Barack Obama was born in Hawaii, he failed to locate the birth certificate. And that's puzzling to us because the Department of Health in 2001 went electronic on all their documents. In other words, they were all stored on computer. So the common logic would be if I needed to find a document, I call down there and I say, Excuse me, I'd like to have Mr. Obama's birth certificate. You press the button and print it out. Obviously, that didn't happen. They didn't have it. They went on a search for it. He couldn't find it. He went to 30-some-odd radio stations and said he couldn't find it. Then, lo and behold, a document miraculously appears in a book, a bound volume of birth certificates from 1961 on a shelf with 499 other 1961 birth certificates. And the story goes that they broke protocol. They took the document, made two photocopies of it, and that's what they sent out to the President of the United States. Our contention would be is if that's all you did, we should have had a photocopy of this scanned into a JPEG file or even a PDF file for that matter and uploaded to the White House, and it should have just been a one-dimensional document. We believe it's manufactured to back up the story and give the impression that it was photocopied from a bound book. Um, I can't go into the particulars. We do have you know, uh, uh, forensic information to back that up. The Selective Service card, we were put in the direction of that. And that's actually been out for, for a while on, on websites and blog sites. People question the Selective Service card. The Selective Service card in and of itself, though, is problematic. It has a post office date stamp that uh, once it's received at the post office, it is date stamped to be canceled. In other words, it's been received. Um, the law back then in 1980, as put forth by, I believe, President Carter, was that any male 18 to 26 
was required by law to present themselves at a local post office, provide identification, fill out this card, and register for selective service. The card put forth uh, on the internet was actually acquired through a Freedom of Information Act request by a former INS ICE government agent. And that individual put that request forward, got a little bit of a runaround. For a little while there, nobody could find it. Then lo and behold, they find it. Sounds very familiar, like the birth certificate. Story. Same story. They find it. About a 10-day span of time goes by from the time they announce that they find it to when they send this to him. And they forward him the card. When he gets the card, he takes a good look at it, and there's that date stamp. The only problem with the date stamp is it should have said, I believe it was July 29th, should have said 1980 on a Hawaiian postmark. Mr. Obama says July 29th, 80. Looking at that stamp, it looks a little suspicious. We took the stamp to a number of retired post office workers. We took it to a couple retired postmaster generals, had them look at it, people that handle this stuff all the time, and they also agreed it looked suspicious. Doing a little more investigative research, we actually determined the stamp that was used at the time. We actually acquired a stamp. We actually acquired some date stamps. What it looks like to us is a deviation from the policy set forth by the post office and DOD that the date stamp used would have been a PICA 40 date stamp. That date placard should have been one solid piece of rubber and a four digit year date, 1980. Mr. Obama's is an 80. Another FOIA request was put forth, and this time the request was to see other Selective Service cards from the same time period owned at one time or, or privileged to deceased individuals, so now FOIAable. They could be obtained. We got 16 of those, two of which were actually in the same post office almost days apart from Mr. Obama's. All of those other date stamps, no matter how they were stamped or how they were inked, all had four-digit year stamps, 1980. Comparing those, it became evident to us that the 80 on Mr. Obama's didn't line up like the other ones. It was offset dramatically to the right and low to the right. Looking at that, we had to, make, we had to try to come to some kind of theory as to what happened here. And it became apparent to us that if you were going to manufacture this date stamp, it's very difficult to go back and find a 1980 date stamp. It's some 40 some odd years old. You would have to uh, literally either go back in time and hope some post office had one, or wait to the year 2080 to get another 80. Well, that's a way off in the future. That's not going to happen. We believe what they did is they took a four year date stamp, 2080 for 2008, severed it in between the two zeros, cutting it in the middle and then inverting it. So instead of 08, it now looks like 80. They load that into the handle to stamp the document. What they didn't realize is if that date stamp isn't cut true, isn't cut square, when you load it into the handle, it pushes against the little compartment side it rides in and would offset far to the right. And if it was cut on an angle, it would offset far to the right and low. Well, I replicated that, and to my astonishment, I reproduced exactly what looks like Mr. Obama's date stamp. I, I would actually gasp. I was like, oh my god, I produced this. This is what they did. Our contention is there is just no way, no logical reason that anyone in 1980, no post office employee, would have any reason, especially mid-year, to tamper with a four-year digit stamp. It sits in that handle for a year. Also on Mr. Obama's, you can see the circle of the seal is fully visible. It was pressed squarely down. I tried to rock it, move it, do whatever I could. You cannot get it to erase the four-digit date stamp. So our contention is that is another manufactured document. Okay. And uh, lastly, um, have, has, has your cold case policy team looked at or considered uh, the president's unusual social security number from the state of Connecticut. That has been plaguing us. It, we cannot come up with any information that says the president ever resided in Connecticut. I don't understand how a high school junior, I guess at the time, would have traveled all the way there to Connecticut to get one from Hawaii when you could just went to Hawaii and social security and applied for one. 
Um, it's normally the, uh, the state where you were born. For instance, I was born in Omaha, Nebraska. I've got 033. This is Nebraska Social Security number. It also goes by where the post office mark is that you register. In other words, the mailing address. So if you mailed it to an address, if you instructed them to mail it to an address in Connecticut to receive it, that could be where they put it as well. We, we found that out. But there isn't any evidence to say he was there at that time, and he's offered no explanation for it. We've run into some roadblocks. The government has flagged his Social Security number. It's almost impossible to run on databases now. Even on civilian private investigator databases, they've been locked out. So we have an obstacle there we'll have to try to overcome. Okay. And um, one, one last thing. Uh, from, did, uh, do you want to comment on uh, Andrew Breitbart's involvement early on, or is that something for? I think commenting on, on Mr. Breitbart is really Mr. Corsi. He, he knows that situation better. The one thing I will say to you, though, I am curious. What Mr. Breitbart said at CPAC as to the videotapes he was in possession of, what was released pale in comparison to those statements. Mr. Breitbart made it really clear of who was going to be on those videotapes and what was going to be said, and we haven't seen them yet. I am highly suspicious of that. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, uh, the, timing of the, the timing of the incident is a whole other issue. Okay. And, um, is, your, is your case, um, one, one other thing, is your, your team, Within, is it within your jurisdiction to uh, to look into um, the Obama's uh, eligibility as a dual citizen, for instance? Uh, in other words, did he have an Indonesian passport at any time, or would he have applied for financial aid at Occidental College, for instance, or Columbia under a foreign nationality? Right now, it is in our jurisdiction to look into that. This is an issue that could affect every voter in Maricopa County. It is a fraud investigation. Um, and we have every right now to pursue this to verify the identity of the individual who wishes to be on the ballot. It's as simple as that. Okay. Um, that's brilliant. Uh, do you have any closing statement you want to make um, as to uh, just, just um, foreshadowing ahead a little bit um, how long this investigation is going to go for? And is, is this up to Sheriff Joe to say when, when to sort of hit the brakes, for instance, or draw a line under a certain aspect of it? Sheriff Opayo has decided that this will be an ongoing investigation. He's giving me no indication that this will stop anytime soon. As a matter of fact, something about the sheriff. The sheriff has been a law enforcement officer for 51 years, as long as I've been alive. He knows when it doesn't look right. He knows when it doesn't smell right. He's given us full authority to continue on, and he wants us to. I don't see it stopping anytime soon. And what's really clear right now, after we've sat and spoke to Mike Zullo from the Cold Case Posse's investigation team, is that they have an actual case here. And right now, legislation is in committee in the Arizona Congress to pass a bill that will put the president's eligibility right on the forefront. In other words, he will need to prove his eligibility beyond a shadow of a doubt in the state of Arizona if he is to be on the ballot in the election come November. And that legislation is currently being held up by Senator Bartow in Arizona. Yes, uh, thank you for being here today. I think uh, this bill, HB 20, is 2480, 2480 um, is very important because it's going to set a precedent nationally for the bar that we expect from our public officials. Every public official should, like they take the recall or any other requirements when you sign up to be a public official, should be very clear in being able to say that they are qualified and they're pre-qualified. But what I like most about this bill, besides having the individual candidate on record for any office in this state, is the fact that you, the citizen, have standing if the person who's running or in office has perjured themselves in some way where they're not qualified for office. So I think this is a very good protection of our um, our own liberties to have people in office that are pre-qualified. And with that, I turn it over to the next speaker. Representative David Bernal Smith. Thank you. You know, I uh, support this bill. And, uh, Carl asked me to come here uh, and stand behind the sheriff because I, I appreciate what the sheriff done uh, in regard to this because it took courage to do this. 
uh, even though that uh, there's been some accusations by the federal government against him, he then investigated uh, the President of the United States. And he, he provided me with a, a letter that he sent to the uh, director of the uh, Selective Service. And he also served me with a copy of Barack Obama's Selective Service registration form. And I, I challenge anyone in this room to look at this form and say it's not suspicious. It, it's dated July 29th, 80. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I've been a lawyer for 30 years. I've never seen a government official a document that says 80 instead of 1980. This document has some questions. And I, I applaud the sheriff in the writing to Director of Selective Service, Romo, and say, give me some answers. But Sheriff, I predict this. I predict in 30 days, would you ask him to give you an answer, he will not answer you. And Sheriff, stay on them because we deserve the answer. The people of Arizona deserve an answer. And the people of the United States of America deserves an answer to whether or not Barack Obama, uh, Barack Obama is true to his name or is it a phony. That's my comments, and I support this bill. I support Sheriff Apaya. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, to the press for coming here today. I think it's appropriate and fitting that we have this press conference here in the old Senate chamber. This very building, not uh, a little bit more than 100 years ago across the hall, they debated whether or not women should have the right to vote. And this state stepped forward as one of the first states to grant women the right to vote. So how fitting and appropriate that this state also step forward and say that our ballot, no matter what office you're running for, should have the highest degree of integrity and validity. And to give the average citizen the ability to preserve, protect, and defend their own constitution couldn't be more American and couldn't be more nonpartisan. So I urge the public that's hearing this message to encourage their legislator as well as once again uh, Andy Tobin, the Speaker of the House, and the Senate President, Steve Pierce, to move this bill along and to hastily put it in, into practice. So with that, I'll yield to questions myself, and uh, you may have some technical questions for uh, Mr. Zullo. So is there any questions? So what's the hope of Carl? I mean, you can't, you can't get it through a committee? The, um, as I understand it, I spoke with Senator uh, Nancy Bartow two weeks ago. Uh, at which point she had told me she would withdraw it from the committee it was inadvertently assigned to. It was designed, this bill was a striker and it was going to be what it is, uh, ostensibly. She, I have seen, I have a copy of the said withdrawal. Uh, I have made sure that the Senate President's office had said withdrawal uh, from that committee. I'm being told that it can't be heard in rules because it's still in the Health Committee. I ask repeatedly, the withdrawal is here, will it please be withdrawn, will it please be heard on the floor? I have 17 state senators who have committed to vote for the bill, uh, and I've informed the Senate President of that. Uh, I've asked him in numerous times to move the bill along. Um, as I understand it, Senator Nancy Bartow has asked me for a thing called a laundry list. I come to understand that the request is not part of our rules in the legislature in any official capacity. Uh, it's a standard of getting an autograph from every state senator. If I can't take the word, we have two things down here at the Capitol. We have our word and our vote. And easy, uh, both are easy to lose if you're not careful. So if I can't trust the word of a senator I, I speak to face to face and say they're going to support the bill, to go back and ask them to initial the same card I used to mark down that they were supportive, I think is a little over the top. But if, if Senator Bartow is requesting me to go to each one of the senators that said that they would support the bill, I will do that because uh, the, the integrity of the ballot is that important. But for the last conversation I had with the Senate President a week and a half ago on that subject, he told me that that was not required in this case and that the bill would move along. So I am not clear on exactly what's happening. I'm getting mixed messages. But when I speak directly with the Senate President and uh, Senator Bartow, I get the picture of they'll withdraw the bill from committee. Senator Bartow said that to me. Uh, the Senate President told me in no uncertain terms that I don't need a laundry list as aforementioned, which there are no rules about that. Uh, so I, I don't know where to go from here other than to ask the public to ask the Senate President why this bill isn't moving. Has it been through Senate June yet? It has been through committee. Uh, the next committee for it to be heard before is what's called Rules Committee, which uh, is really a committee that every bill goes through. It's a, more of a technical procedure. Uh, it's ready to go to rules except for the fact that they haven't withdrawn it from the Health Committee. That's the committee that Senator Bartow chairs. 
whom she told me she would withdraw, and I have a copy of said withdrawal. So uh, I, I, I don't understand what the hang-up is. Are you, are you fixing some kind of deadline for actually getting heard in a particular chamber by? Well, actu actually, yes, because the deadline at this point would be sine die or the completion of our labors. Um, at this point, arguably, if it's not in the Senate Rules Committee next Monday morning, uh, probably not going to have time to have it be heard properly in the Senate and then heard back again, a final read in the House. So, in effect, yeah, it doesn't get heard one more day, right? Most likely. And it, 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 you know, you can't say a bill is dead until we're signing die, right, right, right. but uh, I, it's on life support for sure if it's not on the Senate rules agenda on Monday. Any other questions? Once again, I'm, with, I'm sorry. I was, I was a little curious about why, why this is winding up in the Health Committee. I, I would think logically it should go to the judiciary. And you know that the chairman of the board was the, the bill was a striker bill when it came over to the, the House. Uh, I knew based on things happening here that it, it would be a, a potential bill for a striker. So what I did is I asked the uh, leadership to place the bill in the Government Reform Committee, which they did. They also placed it in health because the former title was a title that had health in its uh, concept. That's why it was inadvertently assigned there. That's in large part why I believe Senator Bartow had agreed in large part to withdraw because it wasn't the construct of the striker had nothing to do with health. So, it's election law. So what can President Pierce do? I mean, obviously he's the leader, but what can President Pierce do if you got a major What can President done? Pierce do? President Pierce is holding the bill right now. President Pierce is complete. He's the chair of the Rules Committee. President Pierce is the decider of whether or not it gets a third read or goes on Committee of the Whole. So right now, it's in President Pierce's hands. And what has he expressed in his committees about it? Every conversation I've had with Senator President Pierce has been one of clarity that he's willing to move the bill along. So I, I have no indications from Senator Pierce, the conversations I've had with him regarding this bill and the movement of this bill, anything other than it should be moving along. Mystifies it sounds like. It, it does. But you know, one of the best things here, and I really appreciate so many of you in the media here, the best things that we can do at the Capitol is put the public light on things. And when the public light is there, typically things uh, move forward. So I thank you for, for being here. I thank you for uh, your involvement. And if you have any other questions after this press conference, I stand ready to answer them. Just contact my office. Thank you. So let's see what happens. If this bill does not get through committee, and does not pass the House rules by Monday, it could very well be dead. Yeah, it's unfortunate that we have to put a bill like this uh, forward, but we really need to make sure that people are who they say they are and that they qualify and pre-qualify for elected office. And, but the thing that I like the most about this is that it gives standing to the individual citizen to challenge a public official if they are found to be um, uh, out of integrity, really, as far as what their qualifications are to be an elected official and of course one of the you know you've got age you have citizenship you have a number of different areas where we look at qualifications um, so I think this is just holding politicians accountable I think it's a good move um, it's a shame that there's a cloud over our own president as to whether or not he is an American citizen uh, it's a shame that there's not more uh, emphasis on bringing forward the facts uh, when you I mean I don't know I know you go online and we see different blogs I've actually seen uh, clips of Obama so saying that he's not an American. Um, when your own president says that he is a foreigner, has taken foreign education uh, money as a foreigner to go to our schools here, you begin to wonder who's telling the truth here. And so there's so many inconsistencies. And I think, you know, we all love this country, we all support our president, but we don't want to be supporting someone who is lying to the American public as to his origins. And, we ask to become and state, I think that's a big, a big problem. We're setting a precedent here in this country whereby...
Okay. Um, as a state, we need to have standards. Right to vote. So, so I think what we're trying to do Arizona here in Arizona, Arizona is always at the forefront of, of a lot of uh, cutting edge now. issues. We have a big problem with the federal that, government uh, that, uh, um, they're, they're doing what they're it. hired by us to do. Well, and I would just we don't like to have to enforce laws that should be enforced by the federal government, but we found ourselves in a position where we have to do so. So, even a fundamental issue is vetting for a public office. Which is a no-brainer. It really is a no-brainer. I mean, everyone who comes forward for public office should be honest up front as to who they are and what they are. And if they're not, you know, the voters will vote them out. But the main thing is, we, at, at some point, you know, if there's a reason to challenge them, we want to have the ability to do so without the court saying, oh, you don't have any standing. I'm an American citizen. I don't have standing to challenge someone who's perjured themselves in front of the American people. So, um, I think it's time that we stood up and, and made uh, this type of position stand. We need to stand for America. Do you, do you think that uh, this effort here in, in your legis state legislation can uh, encourage other states to mount similar legal challenges? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think that the American public is hungry for honesty. They're tired of the spin that comes out of Washington, that comes out of the political realm anyway. This is a good step forward, and I think that no one should fear putting sunshine on this issue. So. Clearly, as I'm standing with you today, thank you. It shouldn't be unprecedented. All the legislation does, again, is just give average citizens the ability to hold all public it's, officials it's, in the uh, state accountable. If a, if a candidate on the ballot is not qualified, the citizens should have the ability to challenge that and question that. Right now, under current law, they do not. This bill would give them the clear legal authority to challenge or question any candidate on the ballot, and obviously the most important candidate, the President for the United States. Are you surprised by the amount of support you've gotten from your fellow legislators and also from your constituents on this? I'm not surprised by the support of the general public and several of my colleagues, a mass majority. In fact, a strong majority of both chambers support this legislation. What I'm really disappointed with is apparently the gamesmanship being played by Senator Nancy Barto. I, I, like I said before, we got two things down here, our word and our vote, and both are easy to lose if you're not careful. And when I speak directly with people like Nancy Marto, who tells me that she's going to withdraw from the committee, when I get a copy of the memo and I give it to the leadership and they tell me it's fine and it'll move along, and it's not moving along, and I have no reason, no one tells me why, and then I hear some comments from the press that allegedly I'm supposed to do this mythical laundry list and have autographs on it that's not even in the rules. So it's a surprising to me that somebody in leadership with, with mass support of the caucuses, both caucuses, would, would play games with a bill and make me comply with a rule that doesn't exist. Do you think theoretically, I'm just hypothetically, if one were to present a laundry list with initials of the supporters of this legislation, could that be used in kind of in a politically divisive way in between the time of receiving that list and when that, that bill is going to the floor? Well. I don't know. I, you know what? It could. It's plausible. I think. Um, I think at this point now is for me to, to double back with the Senate President Nancy Barto, and and if they want me to uh, have this laundry list, then that doesn't exist in the rules, then I'll go public again and say, here they are, making me do something that's totally outside the rules of the legislature. Even on a casual glance, one of the most shocking things about all the things that we've discovered this week in Phoenix is that behind the current president, Barack Obama, there appears to be a web of lies, of forgery, of fraud, that stretches all the way back to the year 2000, and even further beyond that. So we all have to ask ourselves, how deep does this particular political rabbit hole go? Well, I always thought that, um, even going back to April 27th, that my book's publication was the reason that Obama released the birth certificate. I know Donald Trump was making an issue of it as well, uh, but the, my book had reached, where's the birth certificate? It had reached number one on Amazon, and that was a month before publication. If Obama didn't do something, we were gonna be, probably gonna be the biggest book I ever wrote. And I've written some pretty big books, thank goodness. But you know, here, this one, even with Obama releasing the birth certificate, made the New York Times best-selling list and still sold 
something like 100,000 copies. So, I mean, this has been a huge issue. And Obama, in releasing his so-called birth certificate, a forged document, what's the matter? I lost your signal. Uh, say check, check, check. Check, 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 check. Okay. How much of it did you lose? Nothing. Okay. Just flipped up. Uh, so, um, you know, even with Obama releasing the so called birth certificate, uh, the book was a huge bestseller. And it shows the degree of interest and the lack of trust or confidence in Obama having released a, a, a pretty clearly forged electronic document. I said that almost immediately. Uh, and when you take a look at Bin Laden then being killed. I mean, clearly this was a wag the dog. This was an attempt to change the narrative, to get the emphasis off the president. Uh, the Obama people think that they're great media matters. The left wants to control the narrative. They want to dictate what Americans can think or what questions Americans can ask. Well, it's just not going to work. A birth certificate is fraudulent. Sheriff Arpaio's investigation's already charged that. So law enforcement investigation is going to proceed. And as it does, more and more American people, of the American people are going to realize that Obama is lying about who he is and where he was born. There are no, I can't find a single document about Obama's past that's legitimate or not forged. It's a completely undocumented guy in the White House. Who is this guy? And why is he lying about who he is? I think these are the fundamental questions Americans are going to increasingly ask. Now, the latest article immigration records missing for a week of Obama's birth. Just give us a, encapsulate this. Right, well we had been looking for, I've been looking for years for any airplane manifests or INS immigration cards that would document the period of time around August 1961 when Obama was supposedly born to see if the mother and baby had come into the United States from overseas after the baby was born. We finally got, found these INS cards that people filled out when they got to the United States, both foreign nationals and U.S. citizens. And we're looking at the records coming in from the Pacific, because I always thought it's possible that there may be an Indonesian connection, there may be various reasons why instead of returning through Idlewild, which, you know, would be more difficult to control in terms of larger setting, not Hawaii, the connections to wire an entry of a baby back into the United States through Honolulu may have been easier for a family trying to pull a fast one. And so the Pacific records uh, were very highly interesting to us. They were the only ones we had available at first. Now, you know, when we researched these, looking at them, the week of Obama's birth is missing. It's just not there. And you start going through the records, this box says it's going to have the records through August 7th. Well, in August, Second, there's no more records, and the, they are gone. And the uh, National Archives admitted they're gone. We, you know, they sent this to us in a letter. I have a, and they said, oh, well, maybe they got bunched up because of a machine malfaction. Well, this would have been hundreds of cards. There would have been a huge mess at the end of the file. The records are gone. And like so many, is a repeating pattern, so many of Obama's records, they're just missing. You know, the key facts about this guy's life are not available in documentary form. And the left can try to control all the narrative they want. But the truth is, and Alex Jones knows it, I know it, Alex's readers and listeners know it, this is a fundamental greatest cover-up in the history of American you know, politics. And that a lamestream media covers for Obama, refuses to participate in the investigation, and uses Saul Alinsky tactics to vilify anybody who dares ask these questions. I think the American people need to rise up and tell the media, we don't need you anymore. ABC, NBC, CBS, increasingly Fox. Well, they're calling this a left-right issue because immediately critics will say, World Net Daily, right wing, uh, they've got a vendetta against Obama because he's a liberal and he's this and that. You know, it's, it's, it's not really, I don't see any left right fans. Well, the, this in again, any of your reports. Th this whole idea that's a you know, right wing attack on Obama, more Saul Alinsky nonsense and vilification. Right. Left trying to get the narrative under control. 
because the left has got to say, you know, they got the left has got to be Baghdad Bob. They got to say, there's nothing here to see. Move on. There's nothing here to see. Or anybody who's raising any questions about Obama's birth certificate, you got to be a lunatic. I'm sorry. Anybody who believes that Obama's established that he's born in Hawaii, or any other fact about his life, including that he was never a foreign student, just hasn't looked at the record. And when you look at the record, this guy is undocumented. And in addition, World Now Daily also reported that $1.7 million has been spent by the Obama law team in the last few years in order to block any access to any ID records, those specifically those pertaining to Occidental College and Columbia University. The Perkins Coy Law Firm, which is in Seattle, Obama had been using Bob Bauer to be his counsel on all these challenges to his eligibility even before the 2008 election. And we determined the amount of money over a million dollars by just looking at the FEC filing reports from the Obama campaign to Perkins Coy. Then Obama moved uh, Bauer inside the White House and made him White House special counsel and still kept using Bauer on a litigation involving eligibility cases. And by the way, Bauer is married to Anita Dunn, who is the attack dog on Fox. So you now got a husband-wife defense attack dog team in Bauer and, you know, his, and Dunn. Again, leftist-oriented, nothing here to see, Saul Linsky techniques, don't tell the truth, because they can't afford to tell the truth. And then this bogus birth certificate gets wheeled out on April 27th, and Bauer resigns. Well, I think, you know, Bauer resigned, and I've maintained this from the beginning, because Bauer finally looked at the tricks the White House was pulling, sees this bogus birth certificate come forth, and decides he's going to lose his law license if he stays on the case. Withdraws, goes back to Seattle, and says to his buddy Obama, you're on your own now with this computer-generated fraud. Putting this piece of paper aside for one second. Right. Okay. Let's just talk about the definition of natural-born citizen. Right. Has the, has the Supreme Court, to your knowledge, ever ruled on the definition of natural citizen as defined in our Constitution? Well, there's never been a case that has been on point for Article 2, Section 1, determining the eligibility of the president. Uh, I think the 1874-1875 case, Minor v. Happer said, is the really only definitional case mm -hmm. where the Supreme Court made it clear that natural born uh, means two parents who are U.S. citizens at the time the person's born and born in the United States. Now, of course, by the time you get finished listening to Obama supporters, natural born means native born. They try to read the 14th Amendment into it. They read this you know, English common law into it. They refer to cases uh, like this, uh, you know, various cases, Wong Kim Ark case that you know, really is not again on point by a judge who was appointed by Chester Arthur, who himself lied about his eligibility. So the point is, you know, the left would like it to be anybody can, you know, baby f from birth tourism comes in from Turkey. Parents get the child born. They go back to Turkey, raise the kid. And the kid comes into the United States, lives enough years in the United States to qualify for the residence requirement, gets to be 35 years old, doesn't speak a word of English. The left says, hey, natural born citizen as he was born in the United States. Vatel well, Law of Nations, which is an international standard for any bilateral treaty agreements or so that countries can agree with each other right. in a bilateral fashion, says uh, both parents must well, be Vattel, natural born citizens. Yeah, right. Well, Vatel Vattel was the basic philosopher that set out the natural law with regards to the law of nations. And there's good documentary evidence that both Benjamin Franklin and George Washington had, had copies of Vattel and were circulating them and discussing them with the founders during the Constitutional Convention. And also, the whole term natural born citizen is a term of art of natural law. And it does mean more than just citizen. Otherwise, why would the founders write these natural, if they meant citizen, they'd have said citizen. 
And when you go into what natural born citizen means, look, the two parents could have been naturalized as long as they were citizens when the child was born. It doesn't have to have natural born citizen parents. They just have to be citizens. Citizens, they could have been from another country as long as they were citizens when the child was born. You know, this is going to be a continuing problem. For instance, you know, Bobby Jindal, and uh, you're going to have the same you know, problem occurring, Marco Rubio. Their parents were not citizens when they were born. Had their parents been both naturalized when they were born, they would have, you know, Bobby Jindal and Marco Rubio would be natural born citizens. Since their parents were not naturalized, they weren't U.S. citizens when Jindal and Marco Rubio were born. Marco Rubio and Jindal are not natural born citizens. This is not a partisan argument. And by the way, you know, I've written books criticizing George W. Book, the late great Bush, the late great USA. I mean, this is not a, with the, you know, the, the, the narrative that the left wants to spin, that only crazy white wing nutcases ask questions about natural born citizen. The left is covering up that the original questions that were asked in 2008 were the left asking them about uh, John McCain. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it is important to, te do you think, to test the system, and this is an opportunity, clearly, where well, we can test yes. the system as to vetting, for instance, uh, people for public office. This is going to be, the whole issue of natural born citizens is going to be a continuing <clears throat> problem because we have a very, you know, the, the left has been making a diverse population their goal. We've had open borders. We've had many people here from many different countries. And whether somebody thinks that's good or bad or indifferent, it's going to mean a lot of future politicians are born to parents who were not U.S. citizens when they were born. These are issues that, again, we lack a lot of the documentary evidence to determine. Um, Madeline Dunham, Dunham worked for a bank. What her relationship was with the CIA, nobody knows. Uh, Ann Dunham, the, the daughter, when she was in Indonesia, ends up working for the Ford Foundation and Timothy Geithner's father, and then U.S. aid. Well, in these years, when she was in Indonesia that we know of for certain, I mean, even just taking the period of time of, you know, 1960, seven through 1971 when Obama was six to ten years old. Well, that was a very turbulent time in the history of Indonesia. Most likely anyone who was involved in USAID would have had some association like Ann Donham with the CIA. Uh, Barack Obama, out, coming out of Columbia, works for a newsletter company in New York City that is well established to be a CIA front. Now, that again does not mean Obama was CIA. We don't know, we don't have any of the documents about Obama. He won't release his life history. We don't know his full work history or employment history. Um, in terms of the natural born citizen issue, the very fact that Obama's father was a Kenyan should have disqualified Obama because it would mean that Obama was a dual citizen at birth, a citizen of the Commonwealth of Great Britain and a citizen you know, through his father through Kenya. Kenya was a Commonwealth country. And Obama would have been then combined, you know, dual citizen, U.S. citizen through his mother, possibly. Maybe even that's in question. But at any rate, a dual citizen by definition is not a natural born citizen, especially not somebody of Great Britain. That's what the founders wanted to prevent. They wanted to prevent someone who had nationality ties to another country from assuming the highest position in the land, highest government position in the president. And especially nationality ties to Great Britain. Because they're very afraid that through the back door, you know, a, a, a British citizen or someone who is a dual citizen with Great Britain or had been a citizen of Great Britain would become the president of the United States and would have a, an allegiance to the Great Britain that we had just fought a revolution to separate from. Woodrow Wilson. Well, the, the, well Woodrow Wilson it, it didn't really have the birth conflicts or issues of natural born. But the problem we have here is that, you know, if we don't take seriously the issue of Article 2, Section 1, 
that our founding fathers put that into the Constitution consciously because they wanted this purity of birth allegiance to the United States in order to be president, that they created a higher standard than citizen or native-born citizen or qualified to be citizen at birth. You know, they wanted it to be a person whose parents, both parents, were citizens when they were born and who was born in the United States. They did this to the, you know, the current left who's, you know, in love with diversity and we're all citizens of the world, you know, uh, kumbaya. It makes no sense to have these nation-state identifications. To those of us who value country and, you know, are, uh, feel patriotic towards the United States and our history, feel an exceptionalism to this nation, feel an allegiance to the Founding Fathers, abandoning this principle is a foolhardy and, and you can't just throw away provisions of the Constitution that you don't like. The Constitution has provisions for amending it. There have been numerous attempts to amend this provision. They've all failed. Eight, eight, eight Democratic congressional attempts since 2000. Correct. And clearly it looks like anticipation that somebody like Barack Obama is coming around. The Democrats wanted to have to be president. And the Republicans are wink, wink on it too. They're going to do everything they can to look at Marco Rubio being vice president and to say because his parents were, you know, they had a, they were, had a right to be here as foreign nationals, that was enough to make them equivalent to citizens on the way to citizenship. So why should we worry about these distinctions? Well, I think we should worry about these distinctions if we take the Constitution and the intents of our founding fathers seriously. And that's what, you know, it's, this provision has never been repealed. And I think people like myself want to take it seriously. And then when we find the lying, the producing of false birth certificates, the withholding of documents as to whether or not Obama was ever a foreign student at any of these schools, it leads to increasing suspicion that, you know, the Democrats wink, wink, know he's not eligible. And the only way they can hide this great deception is if they vilify anybody who dares ask the question. Because truly, the emperor has no clothes. So anybody who points it out has got to be ridiculed into silence. Can you comment on Andrew Breitbart's uh, involvement in this investigation and the timing of, of what happened to him? And do you think, are you concerned about anything in that department? Let me change tape before you answer that question. Well, I, guys, how long are we going to go? How yeah, long you go? Five more minutes. Oh, OK, I got 10 minutes on this. Topic. OK, let's go. Just quick, Andrew Breitbart. Well, I think, I mean, first of all, I'm, I had great affection for Andrew Breitbart, and I had tremendous admiration. You know, I spoke to Andrew, Andrew even at CPAC and told him the work we were doing with Sheriff Arpaio. So his loss, his, his death, is not only untimely, it's a great tragedy in terms of the uh, investigative capabilities he had and the contribution he was making to America. Um, I want to see the autopsy. I know the family is convinced it was natural causes. Family doesn't want undue suspicion generated. And I, I'm going to respect the wishes of the family. But I'm going to take a serious look at the autopsy results. And if there's nothing there, then fine, we'll respect the wishes of the family. But of course, I think, you know, the loss at the time, Andrew's saying he was going to make these revelations, is going to raise suspicion. And I'm not going to fan the suspicion until I've got more concrete reason to do so. Proof. I want proof. And, and what do you think is the most important? Where we're at today with this uh, investigation here in Phoenix, what, if, if, what's the, for people out there, the uh, audience, viewers, what's really the most important thing to happen right now? Well, this is first of all is a law enforcement investigation. It's the first time a duly constituted law, constituted law enforcement agency has said that there is probable cause of fraud in Obama's birth and other identity documents. If we've got somebody in the White House who's got identity fraud at the core of who they are. This is a question that ought to concern all Americans. And this is not going to go away. This issue is only going to deepen. It's only going to increase the suspicion. You know, <clears throat> whispering to Medvedev and an international, con what is this guy? 
You know, did he ever spend any time in the Soviet Union? We don't even know all the nations he's traveled to. What was he doing in Pakistan? You know, how, where did Obama's passport come from? Did he use an Indonesian passport to go to Pakistan? Was his mother in the CIA? What did he do working for a CIA front? There's only questions about Obama. Intentionally, there's no answers. So with the demise of the United States, the constant efforts Obama's taken to weaken and destroy the United States, things I predicted he would do when I wrote The Abomination. You know, the, uh, the book, Where's the Birth Certificate, has never been more relevant. Go read it now. You'll see the questions that are being pursued and posed there are being pursued by our piles investigation as well. And take a look at this, you know, book, I have two books, the e-book Saul Linsky, The Evil Genius Behind Obama. I think it's critical to understand why birthers are demonized. It's a Saul Linsky act, act, attack, pure and simple. And we have a book, um, The Question of Eligibility, e-book on the Arpaio investigation. That's going to be updated. And anybody who buys that book once can download the e-book updates without additional charge. And this Bill Ayers connection, it's coming up everywhere. Well, and more, we just did the story on the postman. Postman who delivered mail to the Ayers and said that, Mrs. Ayers said that the Ayers family was paying for Barack Obama's tuition at Harvard as a foreign student. I mean, the postman saw Obama, connected Obama with this story. Well, let's see Obama's registration at all these schools. Was he a foreign student? You know, who paid for Obama's education? And this documents Ayer's involvement and the family's involvement with Obama at a much earlier age. There's a relationship. A relationship. They paid for the education. Why? Does this explain why Bill Ayers may have had such an interest even to writing, perhaps, Obama's dreams for my father? These questions are deepening now. They're not going away. They're deepening and they're going to demand answer before the election. Opponents of this particular effort by Sheriff Joe Arpaio in Maricopa County should be under no illusion and not to underestimate the cold case posse team who are both serious and very capable of getting results in the investigation. They've gotten a number of results already and they will continue to bring home results as time goes by. And as Joe Arpaio told us, that this investigation is not going to end tomorrow, it's not going to end next week, and it's not going to end likely next month. This is an ongoing effort because the people of Arizona have given him that authority to find the truth. Ask yourselves, what are you doing in this time of great challenge? What are you doing to unlock minds? Go to InfoWars.com and PrisonPlanet.tv for the latest headlines and cutting-edge information.